Ives has worked in the editorial department for films such as Avengers Endgame and Infinity War, in television including Guardians of the Galaxy, Holiday Special, Miss Marvel, and The Mandalorian. In 2022, he wrote and directed his first feature film, Solid Rock Trust, which at the time of recording is available free with ads on Tubi. And we are thrilled to have him here on Time Shifters now. All that, all that culminates to you being on the Time Shifters podcast. Welcome, Rick. Wow, thank you. I yes, sound well, way cooler. I sound way cooler when you list off all that stuff right away <laughs> than I really am. You got to bring the people in. Put the butts in the seat. <laughs> yeah, appreciate appreciate you having me. Thank you so much. I'm a fan of the show. I know you guys were doing last year. You did like all time travel movies, right? We did. We did. That's why I was thinking before we were, before we started recording that time shifters was like connected to that, but it was just lucky. Yes. Yeah. And then, exactly. And then this year, right? You're doing like. Um, well, it looked good. Yeah. yeah. Well, it looked pretty. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, I know you guys watched my movie. Hopefully, it's one that looked pretty and looks good. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were going to tell you this, but no. Yeah. <laughs> well, we do want to get to that, but I, I did want to talk to you a little bit about your kind of uh, your career is like in the editorial department, and you've actually worked in uh, the uh, visual effects department as well, correct? Yeah, that's right. I saw that you were a, an NCAM operator. Have you ever heard of that before? No, absolutely not. Never. That is the next question. What in the world is that? Cool. Uh, how interested are you going deep dive into Let, film technology? Let's do it. Yeah, okay. No, I want to know what this is. So you guys ever watch Monday Night Football? I know you watch movies, but you watch some sports too. Sure. I've seen you watch the Super Bowls and things like um, that, the big games. I can't remember if I saw it in the Super Bowl this year. Uh, they have this thing where it's like the camera floats over the, the field, and then you'll see on the field – like digital readouts of text. Oh, okay, yeah, sure, sure. Mm-hmm. And that's what NCAM is. That's what it's oh. doing. So they have a live camera tracker on that camera to tell it where it's moving. So is it moving forward, backward, up, down, left, right? What kind of lenses on it? You know, all that stuff. And then the camera can move around, and they'll just plop whatever they want. I mean, in this case, it's text right on the field. And wherever the camera moves, it will adjust the text to make it look like it's really there. So it pops up in sports a lot, pops up in like Weather Channel has them. I know that's kind of cool. That's interesting. I've always wondered about I I do watch, you know, occasionally oh, watch yeah. the games, the sports games. And I was like, I always wondered how they did that because they show where the, you know, where the next, where the down, is, you know, the next, um, uh, yeah, the first sports down, ball. So. First down. Thank you. That's sports the word. Ball. Yeah, I'm going to let you – I'm letting you unfold this. I'm enjoying yeah, that. Yeah, thanks very much. much. <laughs> yeah, no, they, they always mark that. And I was like, oh, it's always curious how they do that. And now now I know. It's, That's fantastic. It's pretty cool technology. There's like a mini 3D camera that mounts to the real camera. And then it looks at a picture and does like a big uh, – they call it a point tracker or like a, a cloud – of all the different points in 3D space, and then whenever the camera moves, it knows it's moving. If that makes sense. Well, that's so cool. yeah. So it avoids the uh, physical bodies moving compared yeah. to the flat terrain. So so in movies, it's a little different. You got two different applications that we use it for. The first one is you could put in a th- same way, like a 3D character or something in three in space right there and now the cameraman doesn't have to pretend that he's looking at it because on his screen he sees an animated character standing right there of whatever like i was so i did independence day 2 and they were putting in aliens and stuff that were going to be there later and you know a lot of times you're telling the actors kind of pretend it looks over here or like i know they did it on a couple of the avengers movies early on and they said pretend the hulk is standing over there you know (laughs) and tell the cameraman okay he's like seven and a half feet tall, just, you know, like do your best to point up that way. But it's different when you can see the actual character to scale in the monitor. The cameraman knows exactly where to look. Director can say, no, move him to the left or spin him around, whatever. Oh, that's oh, um, that's got to be a big help when it comes to the actual directing the the physical actors, too. Because yeah, you go, totally. no, 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 you need to turn turn about like just five inches yeah, to it, your right. So, and then you'll be looking like right you're out. not looking high enough. Yeah. You Red. need to look two feet higher. <laughs> nice. Oh, that's um, very interesting. Move a little over. So you're still in frame, but out of the way. Yeah. And so the other application that you can do instead of that is you can fill in a green screen live and put whatever animation you want there. So a lot of times they're standing on a set and they're looking out at what, like a beautiful sunset and mountains and a spaceship flies in and lands in front of them. Well, in the past you would tell the cameraman again, just kind of pretend it's like flying in and move around and then it's going to land like right over here. 
But in this case, you push play on an animation that's already been done, and then they watch live as that spaceship comes and lands, and they can follow it all the way down from the sky, land, and then can tell the actors to walk out of the little fake, you know, <laughs> ramp or whatever. <laughs> nice. Come down the gantry now. Yeah. So that's what the ant cam does. Yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. fantastic. That's very interesting. How did you get involved in that work? Uh, well, when I started in the industry, actually, I started day one, the day Avatar came out. I started working for James Cameron's 3D company. Oh, wow. Nice. So for three years, I did 3D dailies. Um, you know, the 3D craze, everything was being shot in 3D. So I was there on a lot of those at night processing that footage. And eventually, that company got sold to a company called VER. And I was absorbed into them and they had an end camp system and I sort of found it interesting and they were looking for a guy to do it. So I said, train me. <laughs> and that's how I got onto set for a couple big ones. Um, I did end camp for Thor Ragnarok and like I said, Independence Day Resurgence. Not, not great movie, but it was a fun experience. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and let's see a couple other things like you saw man in the high castle um they were using end cam um that was it and then at some point i was kind of done being on set you know my heart's in post-production i want to be an editor so oh okay interesting um out in out in atlanta they were looking for somebody to do dailies again on some avengers movies and i threw my hat into the ring and ended up moving out to georgia with my family uh to do that and the rest is history. I've been with Marvel pretty much ever since. Excellent. Cool. Now, your work as an editor, I've always been curious. I've talked to a couple of editors and never really thought to talk to them at length at this. It's, it's curious of how that works. It's, since you didn't write the story or shoot the film, how do you go into a project? And to, <clears throat> excuse me. How do you go into a project and choose? You know what angles are used, what scenes stay and go. I mean, I imagine it has to be a big collaboration with the director. Man, okay, so you want you got technical with the end cam stuff, and now we're going deep into editing. Yes, and get ready because I will talk your. I want to know. I, I love <laughs> no, knowing I was... what goes on behind the camera as much as I enjoy seeing what go what ends up on the screen. Yeah, cool. The, the machinations and everything that go on behind the camera, I find fascinating. I know, me too. When when I was a kid, DVDs got popular, and we rented from Blockbuster pretty much every weekend. And every morning after we watched the movie, I would sit there and watch all the special features from every DVD we rented, because like you, I was fascinated with mm -hmm. just the filmmaking process. Mm -hmm. uh, anyways, so let me clarify. For Marvel, I'm an assistant editor. I'm not okay. quite quite the big guy yet. I'm like the support team for the for the first baseman, there's another sports sports metaphor for you. <laughs> uh, and then on the side, while I was doing all this stuff, and Cam and Marvel, whatever, I was, uh, you know, I want the editing credit, so I've been editing low budget features, which is very similar, just you know, less money, but it's the same process. So to answer your question, how do you decide? Uh, yeah, a lot of it's the director; they have a vision for what it's going to look like. They shot a scene in a particular way that they they wanted to move. You know, like someone like Tarantino, I mean, every shot is composed by him and mm -hmm. he knows what it's going to look like afterwards. Um, some people, not so much. Some people just show up with the camera and walk around their actors while they act and put it together as, be as best they can afterwards. Uh, it's chaotic. <laughs> it's a little bit easier nowadays. In the, in the old old timey days, you know, they just had actual film strips and they would go through and find their favorite take and they would cut when they needed to. Mm -hmm. And it's as simple as that. And it was laborious process because they actually went in and like cut the film and spliced it on the next piece and all that stuff nowadays it's a lot more <laughs> oh you have i have actually <laughs> oh nice nowadays it's a little more experimental i guess because it's digital you literally can do anything and it's very quick and in some ways that's scary because the possibilities are endless but for me personally i just sit down I look at a scene and I think, okay, I'm sitting in the room while this is happening. What do I want to look at right now? So am I looking at the person talking or am I looking at the person reacting or am I looking mm -hmm. at the explosion or am I looking at what they're looking at on the, on the table, you know, like an insert, whatever it is to tell the story and move it forward. It should always be new information with every shot, whether it's a reaction or a feeling or a line of dialogue that's important, whatever it is. So, when I sit down for a first cut, that's what I do is just kind of work my way through in a way that looks cinematic to me, you know, like it's flowing well and it's interesting. And if it's going too long, then you got to cut something out or you're looking for good performances, you know, something that 
looks inauthentic, you probably want to leave behind and look right. for the stuff that you know looks the best. Um, and then you show the director, and they say, "No, nope, this is terrible. Start over." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have to think that at times it's got to be a bit daunting of a task because you've got possibly the same story told from multiple you know, uh, angles, you know, maybe mm-hmm. from several different cameras or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yep. And you have to occasionally found yourselves having to decide, you know, to, to cut a scene or a line of dialogue or something and, and still maintain a coherent story. At least that's the right. goal. Not every movie achieves it. <laughs> it's difficult. Editing is one of those art forms where if it was done well, you have no idea. And right. you only recognize it when it's poor. Bam. Right. <laughs> And you'll come out of the movie saying, oh, that was just so badly edited. But you never come out of a movie and say, man, the editing was so good on that. That's that's very Because good it's point. invisible. I, <laughs> yes. I, I have a few where uh, I actually throw that in there where I – like I'm always – I've been a big fan of The Fifth Element. And I okay. love the editing yeah. in Fifth Element. There are a couple directors out there who you kind of notice a pattern like, man, the editing's so good. Like, vi- like just vibrant or lots of energy. Mm-hmm. You could tell that comes from the director, not necessarily the editor, but they're working together for sure. that. I, I think I notice it most when I come away from a movie and I think, God, just one more pass through the editing bay. You know, it mm-hmm. would have just really tightened that thing up and really made a great yep. film. Yeah. Yep. It is tough. You know, you sit down, though, at a scene and you know the scene's three pages long on the script and it's going to be three minutes here. So just cut three minutes today and we'll see what we got. And you do that for a couple months and soon you have a movie at least to look at. Right. Uh, it's, it's very interesting. And you said you, that was kind of like what you wanted to do. That was what you wanted to get into. But uh, of all the different tasks and everything, editing, that just, it's such, it's one of those industries and or careers that you can't imagine anyone ever deciding that's what I want to do. You, it seems like this kind of thing that that's what you fall into. Uh, yeah. So how, how did it happen? How did it come to be that I that's just... what you wanted it? I really hate hearing about all those stories where people fell into it. Because I'm like, <laughs> why can't that happen to me? I would like to fall into it. These guys are editing Fast and Furious movies. Like, come on, how do you get that? Uh, again, when I was a kid, I was making movies with Star Wars action figures and whatever I could find around the house. And editing was the part that, among all my friends, I was the one doing it because I just mm. really liked it. It's like, man, I will sit. I've got kids. I've got a four-year-old and a six-year-old. And... I'll sit with my four year old and work on a 300 piece puzzle like for a day. And it's the same feeling. It's like every piece, every piece, every piece, the next piece just feels so good. <laughs> so you kind of get into a rhythm and filmmaking, uh, editing is not that much different than that. You just have 3,000 pieces and you got to put it together into a picture. Nobody really knows if it's good or bad yet. Mm-hmm. You just got to do it as best you can feel I can relate a little bit just because of doing the podcasting, doing the audio editing, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, going through. You start with a show that's maybe an hour and 20 minutes long, and then when you're done, it's about an hour or an hour 10 because you get to go right. in and you get to trim that up. And, there's oh, there's that one. If I can just get that, and then boom, now it's a sentence that makes sense and that sort of thing. And yeah. um, And I have played a little bit with video, and my stuff is obviously – extremely rough and amateurish and everything, but it is a lot of fun putting stuff together and splicing in together the scenes and, and doing the, the multiple shots and trying to put it together. And when, when you're done, you know, you get this thing that yes, it looks amateurish and it looks like something (laughs) that you did, you know, on your desk at home, but you did it and it's fun and it's, it's there. I, I, I guess I do kind of understand where the, uh, the love can come from. Yeah. And what you're doing on a podcast, that's a lot more similar to what a documentary would look like, where you just have this footage, it's real life, and you're trying to make it the best that you can. Mm-hmm. And some ways that's harder, and in some ways it's more fun, because you know you couldn't just create it the way you wanted to to begin with, which is what the director or writer are, are attempting. Yeah, you just have this thing, and what you're saying, you got to go through and like take out the, the mistakes and the pauses and dropping a sentence, but you still need to make it make sense, and you're trying to find something that's cinematic and poetic from a person who's just talking or telling their story and yeah it's i bet you would i bet you would enjoy something like that from (laughs) from that aspect actually which is easier uh editing your own material or editing somebody else's oh definitely 
someone else's. I, <laughs> I, was, going, I was wondering that that was, yeah, because you're emotionally tied to right. if it's yours. <laughs> right. The point of, of editing is to get rid of the stuff that's not working, but that's so hard when you were there on set. <laughs> And well, you know and then you're the one that made the thing that's not working. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so, yeah, it's easier. Um, that's why you don't see a lot of director editors. Um, another reason <laughs> is it's just a, a different kind of skill. You know, a lot, not a lot of people know the software as well as, as they would need to. But, um, yeah, that's what I would go with. Well, that's a really kind of great segue. We can actually jump right into the, your first feature film as a writer, director, and editor of Solid Rock Trust. Yeah, I did the thing I just told you not to do. <laughs> <laughs> we were pretty much sure that's where we were going with that. <laughs> yeah. I'll let you in your words. Give us a little a brief synopsis of the film. Oh, thanks for your listeners. Yeah, because I know you guys watched it. So yes. You already know, but. <laughs> Uh, so this is a bank heist movie like you've never seen before. It is a single room and that room is not in a bank and the person you're watching is not in the bank stealing the money. Uh, in fact, they're sitting at a desk somewhere else and they have a whole bunch of cell phones and they're in charge of everyone in the bank who are doing their jobs. And this person, a uh, woman, her name's Maddie. She has a whole bunch of different accents and languages, and she's pretending to be different people with each phone call so that everyone in the bank on her team doesn't know it's her. They're, they all think it's someone someone different. Um, and you've seen a lot of movies. I'm sure you've seen a lot of bank heist movies. Everything that happens in a bank heist still happens here. So we've got double crossings and backstabbings and police get called and shootouts and hostages and lots of twists and turns, except we never leave the room where it's all from her perspective which is kind of fun. So there you go. It's a roller coaster ride. Yeah, and very good. Check that. Now, using a single location like this, I think, is a really clever way to work around what I'm, for what I'm guessing was a pretty small budget. The fact that you had to guess tells me <laughs> it's not obvious, <laughs> which is good. Uh, Being a little generous, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Was this... When was this film? Was this filmed under any like pandemic conditions or was it just strictly a budget constraint or this was just an idea you had that you wanted to try? Um, sort of the last two together. I had been editing low budget features for this company in California. Uh, we'd done like three or four, all sort of in the same range of budget. Um, and I had this idea as a short, actually, before I ever met them for a bank heist that would happen in a single room. Mm-hmm. Um, and I pitched it to him and I said, hey, look, I got an idea for a movie that could be in the same range of budget that you're shooting in, except we could make it look maybe a little bit better because we're not going to stretch ourselves so thin. A lot of times, the, in my opinion, the micro budget movies are trying to do more than they can, if that makes sense. We've run into Too that. many locations, too many characters, stunts, like special effects, and none of it holds up very well because you can just see... They just don't have the budget to do that kind of thing. Fire what if we could do? <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Fire NATO. That was a recent one you guys did. Yeah. yeah. Well, what if you could just make a movie exciting and dramatic and not need all those things was my idea. So I pitched it to them. They liked the idea. I wrote the script. Uh, they gave me the green light. And then COVID hit and everything got delayed. So mm. after you remember what that was like. Maybe it's six more weeks and we'll be back to work. Maybe four more yeah. weeks. Maybe six more weeks. It kept, we kept doing that for a year. The great unknown. Mm-hmm. Eventually, my wife was like, why don't we just shoot this in Georgia instead of California, which was the plan? And why don't we just do it now? If there was ever a COVID movie, this is it. I mean, yeah. we already have one person, one location, tiny crew. There's no, literally no reason you couldn't just do that now. And I took it took some convincing from her to convince me. Um, and eventually we decided, yeah, let's go for it. So the rest is history. Oh, fantastic. Um, the star of the film, which is, I mean, truly, you almost, it's almost a single uh, star film. She has to yes. carry the movie, Coco Marshall. Yep. Um, her gift to jump from accent to accent without missing a beat. Is, Doesn't that blow you away? It is. Yeah. It happens so fast at first that I thought I misheard the first phone call. Right. Gotcha. <laughs> wait, was she doing this before? Yeah. No. yeah. Yes? Wait, did no. I miss something? Wait, was she? Or, fr- or I thought are she we was... hearing a voice overlay of someone else from somewhere else? Right, right. Yeah, that was uh, in, in, incredible. However, did you find her? Was that something that 
I, I have to assume that was something that you would, uh, that had to like a, be a prerequisite. Right. Yeah, totally. Uh, I had written this script. Everyone I showed it to said, this is great, but you're never going to find a person who can do this because it just doesn't exist. And I said, screw you. I'm finding this person. <laughs> Uh, we did a casting call on one of the websites, uh, casting websites, and actually for that part, it was in person because that was before COVID. And I looked at like 300 reels, and we had like, I picked like 30 or 40 that I liked, and like 20 came in for the casting call, and she really stuck out. Her reel really showcased that she could do accents already, and I ended up calling her a year later and said, hey, I don't, I don't know if you remember this, but you came in to you know, read for this part. And I really liked it. And I wonder if you're still interested, I can send you the whole script. And we had a nice talk and, uh, we cast her and she came out to Georgia and she said, Hey, I have a couple more accents that I do. Could I, could I just swap (laughs) some of these around? Because in my script, I had doubled up some of them. I had like maybe three or four different ones. And she said, Hey, I do a New York one and I do one of these and I do one of these can I switch these up? And I said, yeah, by all means, let's use as many as you can. Cause it's so cool to watch. Right. Um, she really can just do it. I don't know if you noticed, but the first like 10 minutes of this movie are one shot. So there's no cuts. Oh, yeah. And I wanted it to feel like a stage play where you're sitting here in the room and you're just watching this and it's not a trick. She's just really good at performing this part. And she also plays a different part depending on what accent she's doing. If you notice that. So sometimes she's like more motherly or sometimes she's angrier. Absolutely. Her personality kind of changes a little bit based on who she's talking to and how she's talking to them. And she does it right in front of you. She hangs Mm -hmm. up the phone, picks up the next one, and she's somebody else. So crazy. Yeah, Yeah. she was quite good at that because even when she'd pick up the Albanian, uh, like her, she, you would watch her do this little adjustment as she (laughs) went to actually talk that way. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, damn. Her character is getting into character. Right. Yeah, yeah I, I I don't know. Maybe it's one of these things where an actual native speaker, uh, I don't know what they'd think of her accents, but just as like the dumb American, I mean, yeah. I, I would be completely <laughs> convinced. <laughs> um, so far, like you're saying, everyone like us who's American says these are great. Anyone who has spoken the other one said they're pretty, pretty good. Okay. So my wife speaks that's... Spanish. She was our Spanish language uh person on set and was like helping her through stuff and then i've talked to a couple of french speakers afterwards who said yeah it was like pretty close i mean you could tell a little bit but right so i'm very happy about that <laughs> good good nice. yeah you, you don't have any uh mary poppins cockney accents going on or anything to really <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> we recently talked to a, another editor i think that turned writer director and i asked when they were planning their shots if they have the editor's job in mind or mm-hmm. if they had to kind of shut that off. And I was mm-hmm. really mm-hmm. curious your take on that. How do you looked at it? Interesting. I didn't hear that interview, but I should go back and check that one out. Uh, I think you definitely have to pay attention to, I mean, I am the editor on set. That's what it felt like. And I knew that I was cutting this or shooting it in a way it would cut this way. You know, um, it's a single room. I didn't want it to look like the same, like a 90 minute scene. I wanted each scene to feel like its own thing. So we shot it in a particular way to do that. You know, if it's more intense, we're moving the camera more and like walking around her or maybe she's walking around the camera or maybe we are static on a very important moment or maybe we're pushing in slowly. And all of that was done with that in mind where I'm going to cut this in a way, you know, here's going to be more frantic. Here's going to be slower, whatever it is. So I was certainly thinking about all that. Interesting. Did he not give that same answer? No, actually, I believe his answer was that he, he, you can't. I, oh man, I could be mistaken. Wasn't he also? In, I'm trying to now. I, I need to. I should have gone back and looked. I'll at go back name. and listen to. Yeah, it. You'd have to remind me which one we're talking about. Yeah, sorry, that probably should have come to that question a little bit more prepared. <laughs> yeah, that's wild. Um, a lot of times, as the editor only, I'm like cursing the director when I'm in the edit. <laughs> <laughs> How could he do this? They just teleported across the room. How am I supposed to get into this scene? How am I supposed to get out of this scene? And I did the exact same thing on mine as the editor. I was cursing myself. Why did you, why did you shoot it this way? This makes no sense. <laughs> <laughs> the first cut I wanted to do, she like transported across the room in in a in a cut. I'm like, I think. Um, but you know, for the most part, yeah, you just have it in mind of what this is going to feel like. 
granted, mine's cheating a little bit because I'm not cutting between actors or I'm not cutting action sequences. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I always had two cameras running just so that I had something to cut to, but I'm always looking at the same thing. That makes sense. Yeah, and you didn't have dramatic costume changes. Uh, Yeah. Continuity is pretty easy to follow. Or like establishing shots and yeah, all that stuff. It was more just following the script as it was written. I didn't have a lot of of leeway in the script once we were shooting it because it all kind of fits together. There wasn't a bunch of stuff I could just take out because then something else wouldn't make sense. (laughs) No, it's It's a tiny little bundle. (laughs) Yeah, that is something with a a film like a single person in a single uh, room and everything. You do have to be, I guess, very mindful of where you are in that space Mm -hmm. at 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 all given times. Right. And uh, we did start with, like, I even told my director of photography, Dakota, I wanted to start wider. We used wider lenses. We used slow dolly moves. Uh, We were physically farther away from her, you know, as we started. Mm -hmm. And as the movie progresses, you slowly, slowly, slowly get closer. And I wanted the setting to kind of just fade away and to the point that it doesn't really matter anymore. You're more invested in what she's listening to and the stakes, you know, on the other end of the phone. And that increases the tension and everything yeah. too when you get up that close and personal. Did you guys, did you guys sure. feel that while you're watching it? Did it feel like it was increasing and you're like getting closer to this? Oh yeah, no. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, okay, it worked. Well, and, and, and that was goodness. the beauty yeah. of having uh, the layout that you did, since it's mostly a single person movie, and it, it was it was really re- well done. The way the concept of her being the the person in the chair. Mm -hmm. Um, having the series of cell phones all laid out, all labeled for who it was, and her demeanor changing, her behavior changing, the accent changing. And it was becoming, it it was really kind of neat the way that um, there was a clear definitive relationship with each of the characters, even though you never laid eyes on most of these people. And you could see it in her performance, but based on the way that the film played out, you would get tighter, more moving on some characters, or Mm -hmm. it'd be a little more mellow, a little Mm -hmm. more flowy on others. Right. And hopefully, you know, by the time they're really in danger in the bank, even though you've never seen these people, you still kind of care about what they're going through. Isn't that strange? You know, when you're watching a movie, you care about people that you've never met before. You're just seeing images and hearing sounds. But this was another step removed, like a radio play. Would you care about these people even if you've never seen their faces? Yeah. Yeah, we keep saying it's kind of a one-person film, but there are other people. Mm -hmm. There's other people, voice actors on these phones, and they all are very distinct characters, um, you know, among themselves as as well. And also, I think a lot of uh, great casting for people that are just on the other end yeah. of a cell phone. Well, it needed to be, they needed to be different. Cause the big thing you run into is how do you differentiate these people? How do you know who she's talking to if you're not mm-hmm. seeing them? So I was really looking for ages, races, you know, all, just a mix of men, women, all different attitudes. <laughs> right. I, I got to throw in here since you, we did have all of them as voices for the most part. I did like the little touch as we get toward the end of the film where everyone at least gets a quick on screen shot yeah, to say this, there was a real person and they were in this spot. <laughs> so I wanted you to have that, the same thing that happens to me. Like I, maybe that was before we started recording, but I listened to a lot of podcasts. You ever get so used to someone's voice, you have this image of them. <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. Yep. And then you finally see it there, what they look like and you think, no. Wow, that wasn't what I was expecting look. at all. <laughs> that's not no, that's not who you are. <laughs> <laughs> Whose fault is that? Is that their fault or your fault? <laughs> right. Either way, somebody's let down. <laughs> um, I wanted people to have that experience, you know, like in your mind you have an idea of what these people look like and then you see them and it grounds you like, oh man. These were real people. <laughs> well, given the mm-hmm. topic, uh, it, it's actually funny you mentioned that cuz uh we're in the middle of a bank heist. Everything's gone really serious and people are dying uh in, in the process but they when we finally see the characters they all look very almost innocent mm-hmm. and, and you're like 
Okay, that 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 wasn't what I was expecting. I wasn't expecting them to be so not so hardened. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, de- I definitely got the impression that she pulled these people from. Uh, it wasn't she didn't go to the criminal underworld, right. or anything. Uh, she found people that were just um, maybe they were desperate in in their lives. Mm-hmm. Maybe they were just looking for a little bit of a, adventure, or um, maybe they were just people that that she could convince to to do this because of x reasons um yeah that's a nice insight thank you mm -hmm. a lot of it was uh you see so many tropes in a bank heist movie it has to be this way and i was like why does it have to be that way all the time you know she's a hacker why are all the hackers in movies have the most up-to-date technology Yeah, I like you know, the little. Uh, they're, first... they're so they're so rich. Like, why are they stealing money? <laughs> it, it, exactly. That's why I love the little comment from uh, the real estate agent and the buyer, and I'm like, oh, somebody left their junk here. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and why are all these professional criminals like so? Like, this is just what they do. But what if what if we had computers and stuff that she had to hack together from Goodwill? You know, because she really needs mm-hmm. the money, and she's just finding people that aren't professional they just need the money and she can trust them enough to get this job done because it's not going to be that difficult and it has to be people she's never met before so how, how do you how do you vet somebody for that and uh yeah i was just looking for different ways I mean, there's no smartphones because those can be traced so she's going to use flip phones and you know there's a lot of reasons why this is different than just a high-tech you know heist thief movie yeah no i almost want to see like the prequel when she's finding ways to recruit these people. Oh, yeah. I'm just imagining someone who's a, a stay-at-home mom who's trying to, you know, maybe she's a waitress during the day <laughs> and you know, she gets this strange phone call. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. There is definitely another movie in here yeah. where you do that and then you're only seeing what's happening in the bank, but you never see the person in the chair. And then there's some reveals yeah. there from from the other perspective, right? <laughs> oh, there's there's I think there's several films you could actually make based on this with just the different perspectives. Like I, I, at the one point or another, there's like a one or two people in different areas of the bank. You could almost tell a movie from just, just from that their perspective. perspective. Yeah, yeah. See, I want to make the SNL skit where the entire scene is just the one guy drilling into something meaningless because that's his job. <laughs> and and that, that's the only perspective you get is this guy drilling away and occasionally getting a phone call. I'm like, yeah, I'm still doing it. And he keeps getting told, uh, we don't even need to do what you're doing right now, but keep it up. <laughs> right. Because <laughs> we're not stealing anything in that vault. No, no, no. Uh, and, and Spoilers. I, I, yeah, no, I don't want to get into spoiling too much of the film, but I will... I kind of liked that there was this this kind of goodwill effort mm-hmm. that was part of the heist, but then most of them didn't know that that was a component. Right, right. <laughs> right. Like I like the angst of that. Yes, I'm doing a great thing, but no, you're not getting what you think you're getting. That that was interesting. <laughs> I like yeah. that. Mm-hmm. It's funny in in crime movies in general, you always end up rooting for someone who's doing bad things. Isn't that right? Yeah. And and take this for the compliment (laughs) that it is, but I kept channeling Inside Man while while I was watching this, too. Well, I've got as many Bank Heist movies as I could get. There's homage paid to all of them uh, hidden in there. Inside Man's definitely one of them. In fact, the Albanian thing is from Inside Man. It is from it. Yeah, I I caught (laughs) on to that, and I'm like, oh, wow. Okay, cool. (laughs) But, uh, yeah, it's funny. Like, you're always rooting for people to break the law and get away with it just because there's worse people who are also characters, you know, who are the actual mm-hmm. bad guys. So I did want to play with that a little bit. She thinks, at least she thinks she's kind of a Robin hood character mm-hmm. and we get into some gray area there and whether she is doing a good thing or not. I don't know. And I purposefully left that kind of up to you to decide what the morality of it was, but well, I love that uh, you kind of get a little taste of that from our one law enforcement person that uh, we we deal with mm-hmm. is he, he kind of sees her side, but you still can't do this. Yeah. Right. I don't know if there is a straight good guy, bad guy of any of these characters. You know, they all have their flaws mm-hmm. and they all have their motivations and who's right and wrong. I don't know. <laughs> 
Right. It's kind of the world we live in these days. And actually, it's one of the things, uh, since you do all the work in, in Marvel, and I have this conversation with my son all the time, is the interesting thing that Marvel has done with its bad guys Yeah, is it's given them an actual reason to do the things that they're doing in a good light. Yeah, they've really figured out how to motivate them in a way where you kind of see where they're coming from. It's Yeah, the, the, the famous, of course, being... Was Thanos really that wrong? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, his intentions were pure, even if he went around right. it the wrong ways. Now, in uh, did you guys watch the the latest Thor movie? I did. What was that no, one called? I Love didn't. and Thunder. Eh, it wasn't my favorite, but I found myself during that movie actually rooting completely for the villain. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The the villain in that uh... <laughs> to the very end, I thought, no, I think he's right, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what yeah, that says he, about me, but he, he's kind of on to something. So, <laughs> but yeah, no, and, and having that a component in here, everybody in the film, right or wrong, has their own motivation, and you can probably find yourself sitting in their seat at some point, mm-hmm. and maybe making the same choices that they are. So, do you think you'll continue to uh, write and direct? Uh, yeah, great question. And do you have mm. anything on the plate? <laughs> Yes. So uh, I'm always working for Marvel. If I ever do something else, it'll be in a break from there. I usually have a month to maybe three off in any given year. They're a little busy. To squeeze this in. Um, the funny thing is I started writing just to become a better editor. That was my hope, was to understand mm-hmm. why feature films are constructed the way they are. You know, why are scenes happening when they are? What's happening during the scene? What are we learning about the character? When do we come in? When do we leave? You know, all that stuff. So in that in that respect, it was kind of fun to just put something together and, you know, make sense of all that. Um, so I've written, I've got four or five other scripts that I've completed, all various budget ranges. So it kind of depends on how well this movie does and then who sees it and comes along and saying, what's next? Um, I've got ideas for two or three solid rock trust movies because it's just a heist with the team and we could do that a dozen times i think (laughs) (laughs) and kind of follow maddie along the way and see what else we can discover about her i kind of went into this but the goal was to do a a heist movie that still followed all the rules but subverted you know all of them and showed you them in in a different way uh followed the rules but subverted expectations yeah yeah so i'd like to do that maybe with another genre um, I'm looking at maybe doing a horror movie that does kind of the same thing. I really enjoy the idea of rules that you have to follow, and everyone knows these rules, but you can break them if you understand why you're breaking them, and if the audience is on board with it, then it can be fun for for everybody. So, so. you're going to make Scream. <laughs> <laughs> I do love this. Man, that first Scream is... Actually, I'll be honest. I love all the Scream movies, okay? <laughs> I lost it's, track after a while. <laughs> I mean, they get totally soap opera y and oh, yeah. so so twisted that you can't even believe it's happening anymore. You know what what's happening, but it's still fun in that way. Where yeah, they the characters know what's supposed to happen. You know what's supposed to happen. The filmmakers know what's supposed to happen. So get ready for a ride because it could be anything or none of it. <laughs> right. I tell you what, though, just let Marvel let you direct the next film, uh, Mister <laughs> Mister Feige. Tom, Tom yeah, uh, has Kev, a great idea for Kev, you. Kev, Kev, come, come talk to me. Can I call you Kev? Yeah. K-E-V-I-N. <laughs> uh, you never know. Yep. Uh, most of the directors they get are um, pretty well established already. Yeah, a little, little bit. Uh, even, even when you look at directors, like for the TV shows, people you've never heard of, they've still done some big stuff. That's what Marvel likes to go after is like up and comers, but not quite beginners. Yeah. <laughs> <That makes sense. laughs> Come on. You, you got a feature film under your. Uh, so under you your never belt. know. Um, I'm still having fun just working on the projects and being oh, a sure. part of it in, in any aspect that it can be from the time I was a kid. You know, it's like, I don't know what I'm going to do in the film industry. I just know I want to be working on movies and have my name in the credits and be so proud of that. And so far, um, I'm happy with what I've done and we'll see. No, yeah. excellent. Well, it's going to be fun actually. Next time I watch a Marvel movie, and I'll be able to see your name in the credits. I'll, I'll be like, oh, okay, I I know someone that made that scene better than it probably was before. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, it's crazy, especially movies that big. 
they're giant machines, man. And you sit mm-hmm. and watch the credits, and it's ten minutes long, and so many people go into yes. it. And that's why it's so expensive, man. Think about payroll and all that stuff. Oh, I know. Um, but no matter no matter what job you have, I mean, even the lead actors are still a relatively small part of the big picture. It's crazy. Yes. So it takes a it takes a village, I guess. Yeah. I insist whatever you do next involves Coco as well. Oh. Yes, please bring me a more Coco Marshall. That's she one was that fantastic. you cannot – yeah. How could you ever write something if you know her and not have a part? Um, she's in a yeah. bunch of different stuff you can find. She's been the lead in like a horror movie. I think it's called The Perfect Host, which is pretty good. She's got a Lifetime movie she led coming out in a month or two. And wow. she's in a fun romantic comedy that just came out last year too. I think it's the one you're with. Nice. So she's definitely out there if you want to see more. Yeah, she's great. Yeah, no, yeah, she was definitely an actress that once once you see her, it's kind of like, okay, I need to find some more of her films. She does with the, the voices a little bit what the Tatiana Maslany does with personalities. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, you know? <laughs> that's right. Uh, she's just really good. And you know what? She's also really fun to be around. She That room we were in, that's a real abandoned building, by the way, that we got for <laughs> pennies on the dollar. That's handy. And, it was 95 degrees in there and 100% humidity in Georgia, and she never did anything but smile and say, okay, yeah, I'm ready to go. <laughs> nice. Very cool. It was very fun. You could have probably gotten a place cheaper if you had the real estate agent actually be the real estate agent in the movie. <laughs> maybe. Maybe you're right. <laughs> we did have a real estate agent. That's how we were looking at abandoned places, and I don't know if we could have got that much place for much cheaper. It was just sitting there, and... <laughs> We were in there for three weeks, and we paid almost nothing almost nothing for it. <laughs> That's so. excellent. Well, Rick, I'm really glad that you reached out and uh, let us know about your film. I've really enjoyed watching it. Um, as I said before, it's available on Tubi at the time we're recording here. Hopefully it'll be out there for uh, a while longer so people can go and check it out. It's definitely worth sitting through a few ads. Tubi is actually one of the less egregious when it comes yeah, to the ads. Yeah, agreed. I've started watching yes. more Tubi, and compared to mm-hmm. Hulu... It's like nothing. You get through them so quick. Um, and well, and I'm also I'm pleased that they are really good at choosing where they put mm, their ads. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean, they're actually at like good breaking. Like the scene actually is going to end not in the middle of a scene. Yeah. So a little, I, I get the impression they're trying. A little behind. Yes. A little behind the curtain information is the filmmakers actually do that. Really. Yeah. So we have to turn in time breaks. For like every eight minutes or something for the whole movie, and then they'll choose when the oh. ad actually fits in. But it, if the filmmaker did their job. It will be at a point that makes sense. <laughs> oh, that's very interesting. Well, there are uh, some streaming apps that or don't. whatever that you want to like call it. It's like in the middle yes. of what here? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. By no, the time no. you get back from this ad, I don't even remember the first half of the sentence that they were saying. <laughs> my, right. my my biggest one that I pick on is uh, especially the uh, streaming services that show older TV, uh, and so like Pluto that has all of the channels that are devoted to like single shows. Yeah. Um, and I'll be on the Mystery Science Theater one, and yeah, that had commercial no breaks sense. planned, <laughs> and they miss each and every one of them. Yes, yes. <laughs> and on Pluto, is it uh, still Mystery Science Theater ads in the Mystery Science Theater movie? Uh, they do ads it. for riff tracks and stuff. That's the ones I always see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, they'll occasionally get, fit that. And if you're on riff tracks, you'll see the Mystery Science Theater one. <laughs> gotcha. Uh, awesome. Anyways, yeah, it's available on Tubi. You could rent it ad-free on Amazon or Google Play or YouTube movies. And if you check back in June of 2023... It's on YouTube worldwide for free. And then our distributor will roll it out to some more places. You'll see it on like Roku and stuff like that in the future. Well, again, Rick, thank you very much for coming on and talking with us and uh, talking to us about your career in the film. I'm really looking forward to seeing uh, what you come up with next. We'll definitely, you'll have to keep us posted. Yes, definitely. And, uh, you know, yeah, next time you, you come up with something, fired you know again drop us another email and uh and and, and let us know because we we definitely want to keep following your career and uh and looking forward to see where you go next oh thank you so much um yeah i know you've done some indie movie reviews on here yes. and some of those were more middle of the road so i'm trying to decide if you're keen on this one just because i'm here talking to you or if you really liked it more but 
Let me come back. Let me come back before then because I want to do a movie with you guys. Okay. Yeah. Well, absolutely. Absolutely. You have, have you so on. much good uh, stuff. I'll... We should give him one from the list for this year. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, you just did a never-ending story. Thank you for being kind to my to my never-ending story. Uh, and I'm a huge <laughs> time travel fan. I know you guys do a lot of sci-fi stuff. Yeah. Me too. Mm-hmm. Um, I watch everything, man. It doesn't matter, good or bad. I, there's always Excellent. something. There's always something to find. We're in that book. <laughs> yeah. We'll give anything. So a send try. me the list, and I'm coming along for the ride. <laughs> All right, excellent. I I will forward you a list of some films that we've got coming up, and uh, if there if there's something that strikes your fancy, you'll have to let us know. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Today was the day we picked up another co-host. <laughs> <laughs> Once in a while, we'll we'll take guest appearances. If, if we could pick up a co-host with an inside track to Marvel, that's not a bad <laughs> that, yeah, thing. No, 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 no. That's an okay way to go. Yeah. Trying to think which Marvel movie would be the well. It looked good category maybe eternals yeah uh, i mean it uh, it looked actually fine. eternals is actually on our list oh it is it is i think or at least it was is it still on the it's list? still on the list it's late later in the year because we're kind of going chronologically through the decades yeah as it turns out i think we will jump a little bit but i did realize that recently that I was like oh we started in 94 and then we're now making we're in progression five and now we're in 97 mm-hmm, yeah. mm-hmm. Well, then uh, definitely everyone you look forward for Rick for joining us again in the future. Yes. And again, Rick, thanks for joining us. It's been a lot of fun. We look forward to talking with you again. Thank you so much. All right. Bye. See you.